scripture reading this morning is 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 4, and Hebrews 13 and 17. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. The elders who are among you, I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God, who is among you, serving as overseers, not by constraint, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but evil, not as being lords over those entrusted to you, but as being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fail. Hebrews 13, 17. Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls, as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. You may be seated.
Okay, you know, we're going to turn that off. <laughs> okay. Good, I don't have to wander now. <laughs> um, as I think of what an elder looked like, we have uh, pictures. These are the men uh, since 2007 that have served as elders of the congregation. Uh, if you look at them, you, you know, you, you can probably remember some of the some of the things that they did they represented as when they were elders uh, many of these men have gone on to their reward in heaven uh, and and they're men that I looked up to a lot when I was younger uh, and and just really appreciate all they they do we also have black that uh, we've had and we really need to get this displayed out front that has the names of them. So, so even if you don't see a picture, you see the names of the men, and you probably remember again some things about them that uh, as, when they were an elder, when they were a part of the eldership, uh, and things that they did. And so, when you think about that, what do you think of? You think of a great elder, a great eldership. You think of a motivator, a leader, somebody that's that's helping grow the the church here in this area. I would say they. In, in this time period, 2007 till now, they've made many, many tough decisions that have led us to where we are today. And, and I'm truly thankful and grateful for each of them uh, for all that they have done. I would also say the best elders are not considered good individual elders, but rather part of a great eldership working together for the good of the congregation. An elder should not look for personal gain from serving. An elder should not be forced to serve or required to serve just because they meet all the qualifications, but rather, as the scripture says, serve eagerly without compulsion. And I truly believe I've been part of a great eldership these past four years and sit in the room with some of these men that, that I respect uh, immensely. Also, an elder is or should be, these are just some things that came to my mind, should be available or present, should be at services, should be kind and caring, somebody that's busy as a, as a worker, that's able to listen. But also, I was listening to an audio book recently, and it, it referenced this, that shepherds, uh, elders, are also sheep. And one of the roles of elders is to shepherd the other elders. Uh, one of my greatest memories, I guess, is the time last year uh, we were we were going through a tough time and had to make some difficult announcements. And before one of those in particular, uh, Larry and Davis and, and I met uh, beforehand to talk about it. And as we were getting up, Larry said, hold on, uh, let's pray. And I can say that that was probably the closest I can remember to feeling to God uh, at that point because Larry took the time to pray over us and to, to show compassion and care. And I really think that is a, a big piece of being an elder is, is working together. Having said all that, when I think of, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot this. An elder should not be, these are things that I think of. If, you, if you're looking at an elder and you think an elder should be perfect, well, we're not perfect. Uh, you, you know, we're, we're just human beings like everybody else. We, we don't have all the answers. We're not all knowing. We're not better than everybody else. We don't want to be, be put on this pedestal. And we're certainly not the chief elder, which is Jesus. This is a scripture that, uh, that I like to reference that talks about what a, what a good church should be. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple until breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. That is something we strive for here in working together in it says on a daily basis, not just coming on Sunday or Wednesday, but working together daily and, and doing those things. I think we've got a lot of good things going on. All that to say, when I think of Bart, all of those fit in, in those qualities. And 
Bart and I go way back, and he I think he's probably a little nervous about what I might say about him and, uh, you know, stories. I, I won't tell the story about riding in his Jeep uh, when I was in seventh grade and with no seat belt, no top, uh, standing up, you know, down the street. I won't tell that story. Um, but, you know, when I was in seventh grade, he was a, he was a senior. Uh, he was very active in the youth group, was, a, was an example to, to the younger boys. I remember him teaching classes as long as I can remember here at, at church, being involved with the youth. So many retreats, Bible camps. We, we went to Bible camp. We were counselors together. My favorite was the late night ping pong. Uh, we always we always did that, had a good time. VBS, so many VBS shows, he all shows for older members, served as a deacon uh, over our education for many years. You know, there, I could just go on and on, but there, there's not enough time for that. Uh, you know, and he and his family and, and all of them, they're very special to me, to this eldership and to this church, and we're grateful he's decided to, to join this eldership, and we really look forward to working with him for, for many years. Uh, as you know, we did something a little different this year. With uh, We asked for uh, members to fill out cards, and I have them here, and we had a great, great response. Uh, you know, we didn't know what was, how many we would get because we never asked for a card that says, I fully support this person in, as, as a nominee. Uh, I didn't count them up exactly, but I'm pretty sure it was 60, 75 percent of our congregation turned in a card which is completely amazing. Uh, when you consider the current political environment, when people get 50% approval, they're excited. And so uh, there's 100% support for BART uh, from this congregation, and we're very thankful for everybody that filled out a card and took the time to do that. And when he comes up here, I'm gonna call him up here, so BART, you can come on up now. now you, hopefully you'll find your spot over here. Uh, but I'm going to give him these cards uh, so that he can have them and, and read them at his, at his leisure. Yeah, maybe a little over to the right. There you go. <laughs> uh, so he can read these later uh, and, and see the love and support from everybody in the congregation. Uh, after service, he will also be in the back, and we, hopefully everybody can greet him and, and congratulate him and thank him for that. Also going to bring down Davis and Larry. If you'll stand beside Bart, hopefully they can follow directions as well. Uh, and then uh, Josh is going to come up and he's going to lead us in prayer and then we'll finish the, the lesson from there. You today and thank you for this day hour that we've had and to reflect on your son and what he's done for us as we take part of the great supper that was instituted by him in that upper room with his disciples. We're thankful for that as it centers us and focuses us on what is the main thing and that is Jesus Christ and his church. And as the comforter has come back as he left the Holy Spirit to guide the men that wrote to provide for us the Instructions for church organization. Part of that organization comes with a, a group of leaders known as shepherds, and overseers, bishops, elders. And each group of individuals are to uh, be the shepherds of the flock, the local flock of God, and to, to serve and to, to lead by example and to be willing to uh, proclaim your word and to. to Make sure the word and doctrine is being taught properly. And I just thank you for these men and for what their work, what they continuously do. We, we're excited to add Bart to this a group of individuals. And we pray that uh, you'll give him strength and wisdom, Father, and the heart of a servant to, to come in and to serve and to, uh, again, to be willing to help out and to lead by example, but also to serve by an example as well. I pray for his family, Sharon, and his children, Ned, and Emily, and Rachel, and we ask your blessing to be with them in this process as well, as, as it will affect the family as well. I pray that you'll be with us, us as a congregation, that we can be supportive and loving and knowing that they're by no means 
your son Jesus. They're by no means perfect. They're no my, by no means going to get always get things right. But I pray that you will guard their heart and that you will keep them with integrity, with men of integrity, with uh, being transparent in the sense to where we know where they stand, we can see their heart, and I just pray that you continue to bless them. We love them. We thank you for Bard and his willingness to to accept this role and to be a part of this and to help serve our congregation as we continue to move forward as a church. We thank you for all that you do. In your son's name we pray. Amen. It's an exciting day and as we reflect on Bart now being the, an elder and appointing him as a church and what was said We've had the cards that were in the foyer and appreciate everyone that said what you had to say. Hey, Miss Patsy's here. Good to see you. Yeah, just got now saw you, okay? Sorry. My mind went wandering. Also good to see uh, Frank as well. Uh, anyways, uh, we, we said what we had to say and we've been focusing on Bard and as the elders have presented his name and thinking about... Uh, his life, and, and let's be honest, the two weeks are just formality. We didn't really need two weeks. Really, someone who's qualified is already living those qualifications. And I'll be quite honest with you. When you think about those qualifications, we think about who should be that, and we don't think about ourselves. Though A lot of those qualifications are Christian qualifications. We should all be temperate. We should all be blameless. We should all be people of self-control and things like that. So that really is a reflection of us all, but I want you to think about this question, and, and that's where the invitation, it's where this lesson is for us. What, what's my job? I've been really thinking about that. And I look, notice how I worded the personal pronoun, my, it's my job. It's easy for me to be, as, as a member, because I'm one of you, I'm just a member, I'm not a deacon, I'm not an elder. So I'm really being personal with myself, as with all of us. What's, what's our job? We understand the, the characteristics and, the, and the, the job that an elder should be doing and the great words that are used, three words in the Greek language, presbyteros, episkopos, and poimen. All of them beautifully display what an elder should be and what an elder should do. But have you ever thought about it that when we appoint somebody or when we think about an eldership or a deaconship that you also have a job? And I'm not concerned about your opinion. You're not concerned about my opinion. I really like for us to understand what does the Bible say when it comes to my job as a member, when it comes to the eldership, when it comes to the leadership, when it comes to me serving. And there are two great passages that I think in the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17, as Corey read this, Obey those who rule over you, be submissive. They watch over your soul. They will give an account. Let them do so with joy and not grief, for it will be unprofitable for you. There's a lot that's said in that, but really who the writers were referring to is us as members. For us to allow them to do their job, we need to first and foremost appreciate them for watching over our soul. That's a, that's a big job. That's a difficult job in our day and age today, even more so it seems. Because there's so many things going on and we can get so busy, but to have a pulse of, of the church and to be responsible to give an account, and maybe why it says the way it says for it might be unprofitable for you because they have to give an account. And if they're giving an account about us, and we haven't been so supportive, or we complained, or we didn't like the matters of opinion, the where they were going, we feel like they should do it our way, whatever, then it might not be so profitable for us. We must understand that we understand that this important point that we are thankful that there are people that are willing to be in this position. I've been in churches to where we always get stuck on the idea of desiring the work because who wants to desire, who wants to jump up and say, yes, I want to be 
over, or I want to give an account of everybody's soul. I want to keep watch of everybody's soul. Not many people want to do that. But those that are willing to do that, these, these men, it says something. We should love them for agreeing to do what they're doing. We should have a love for them that's, 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 that's just as we have for each other, but appreciation and a love for what they're willing to do. And I think that ties in that what we allow them to be, do their job and we let them do that with joy, that has to involve love, that has to involve appreciation. That should also involve us praying for them as they make decisions, not only... Uh, for us, maybe as individuals sometimes, but also as a church family. We should be prayerful about them. We should help them make decisions as they help serve us with joy. I think that's so important for us to really examine that verse because that verse is, is really referring to us in our jobs in life and, and especially as members here when it comes to our church family. That... We, we, we support that we are willing to do things. Now, obviously, when in some occasions in times past in some churches that, that, that if it's a matter of doctrine, if it's a matter of word not being taught, that's a different story. We have another verse that tells us that, what to do. But in matters of opinion, in matters of, well, I have a great idea, this is what I think should be done this way, and it's not being done that way, then I can get upset easily. I need to reflect on this verse. I've been preaching for 20 years. That's not a long time, but it's some time, and that's a time enough to be under different elderships. And there have been times where I, I suggested, I think this would be a great idea. Let's go out and do this. No. No, that's not a good time. Now, I have two choices. I could, A... I could say, okay, you, you're the elders, I'm not, I need to deal with that, I, I need to not deal with it, I need to respect that, and I need to continue doing what I'm doing, or B, I can create a problem. And sometimes in some preachers, and some members in churches, they choose option B, and it causes a problem. I came to a church where that was option B before I came, and it caused a problem. And option B is an issue because option B, it makes us think that it's, it's our church. It's what I think is best for this church, and really, it's not about any of us. It's all about Christ and who, what Christ has done for us. It's His church. It's His way. It's His command what he wants us to do second verse is in 1st Timothy chapter 5 verses 18 through 20 this was not read but it talks about leaders it says in verse 17 let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor honor them especially those who labor in the word and doctrine so important the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out on the grain, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not receive an accusation against an elder except two or three witnesses. Those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all that the rest also may fear. Honor those who help guide us in making sure the word and the doctrine is being taught. When it talks about, here's an example, in case there is something happening that is involving sin, and there are witnesses, this is what we need to do. But a lot of church problems that I've looked at and hear about, is really not so much about word or doctrine or not about sin, it's a matter of opinion. And when I read this verse and about accusations, I don't find it involving opinion, do you? In fact, I think verse 20 makes it very clear when it comes to sin. We're all going to have ideas. We're all going to have things that we think we should do. What things that we think we should do better. 
But yet we must understand this is God's way of doing things. And we must respect that way. And we must respect those who are in that position as we must also reflect within ourselves. We must be careful in the language that we choose with all people, especially those that are in an eldership. We must be careful. They have an important job, and we shouldn't make it more of a challenge to them. We need to honor them. So there's really two th ways we could take my job. I can, I can appreciate them. I can love them. I can pray for them. I can understand they're not perfect. They're, they're going to not always perform on a 100% level. That I can help them appreciate and let them serve with joy, not with grief. Or I can make them think, why did I accept this position? Let me tell you the reason why I chose to say what I said. It's not because of this church. It's not because of these men. It's really because of my examples to me. My father and father-in-law are ministers. They've been preaching for a long time. And I look up to them because they are way ahead of the game than I am, and they have seen more and experienced more than I have experienced. But both of them had similar experiences in years past where the eldership made a decision on their behalf which was not beneficial for them. My father was told, without any news, hey, we're going to take a different direction, basically you're fired, but we don't want you to present it that way. And I was so upset when I heard that. I wanted them to pay for that. I wanted them there. It's unfair. They had to sell a house. They had to do this and that. But my father didn't say that. He said, we're not going to do that. We're going to, we're going to be supportive. We're going, we're going to, to not say anything bad about that. We're going to to love on these people because we don't. My father says this, I don't want to hurt the church. And he chose the higher ground. My father-in-law had a different experience, but it was an experience where members were coming to him. Hey, what really happened? What happened? What did they really say? And so forth. He loved the church enough to take the higher ground. He didn't say anything negative. They didn't say anything negative about it when they could easily have said something negative. That's my example. That's my example when it comes to serving. I can choose to disrupt. I can choose to cause a division. I could choose to cause people to leave. Or I could realize it's bigger than me. And it's about Christ. It's about His church. And I don't want to do anything to jeopardize His body of believers. The greatest example for an elder, for a deacon, for a church member is Jesus Christ. The great rabbi, in, in, in a day and age when rabbis were of a high position, where a rabbi had a lot of weight and cloud, where you serve the rabbi with the rabbi needs because he's providing you, he's teaching you, you're the pupil, you're the student. But in John 13, it was the rabbi who dressed as a servant and washed his disciples' feet. He served them with humility. Peter later, as an elder, would say in 1 Peter that we are to serve with humility. I would like to think when he wrote that, being inspired, that he was thinking about that night in that upper room when Jesus serve them as a servant when he was in the position of the great master the rabbi, the savior the messiah none of us are at the level or at the weight of Christ Jesus and if some, someone who is greater than us is willing to serve us then how much more should we cannot make that decision for you, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to support, I'm going to serve, I'm going to let my light shine, I'm going to make sure that the word is being taught, 
and I'm going to make sure that I'm following what I'm teaching and I'm going to try to serve and, and be and support to these men to, so that they could serve with joy and not with grief. What about you? What will you do? What is going to be your position as we move forward today and what is ahead of us? The Bible has some examples and some passages of our position, our jobs, what we should do as flock of members. And that's something for us to follow as they are to follow. We should get to know them as they should get to know us. We should love them. We should pray for them. We should have patience just as we need patience. And we need to be reminded what Jesus says before we look at a speck in someone's eye. We need to consider what's in our own eye. We need to examine our own selves, which is very hard to do. It's so easy for me to look at you and say, this is what you're doing wrong in my mind. I'm, this is wrong. This is not what you should be doing. But I need to look at myself. And so the, the, the invitation is really simple. Look at yourself. Examine yourself. Where are you as, as a believer? As a member of this congregation, what kind of member are you? What kind of believer are you? Would you be someone that loves Christ more than anything else, more than your own positions, more than your own ideas, more than your own way, enough to submit to Him and serve Him? Or are you not? And it really comes down to two choices and it comes down to either one or the other. So I think it's so important for us to first and foremost, before I consider them, I need to consider myself this morning. I need to consider where my heart is and who is Lord of my heart. And who is first in my life. Because that's really going to reflect what I do from here and now on. It's going to reflect my words it's going to reflect my attitude, and it's going to reflect my actions. And if Jesus is not Lord of my heart, then I, have a, I don't have an elder issue. I don't have a member issue. I have a Jesus issue. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Alex has selected the appropriate song. We're going to stand and sing. If we can help you as you examine yourself to see where you are at in the faith and making sure your heart is right with God. The invitation is offered to us all as Jesus offered it. Come to me all who are weary and heavy laden. I will. That's Jesus will give you rest. There's no better rest than knowing spiritually you are right with God. We need to go and we need to make sure God is God of our life. That we mean it. I love God. Do you? Then show it. Isn't that what Jesus said? You love me? Yeah, I love you, God. Keep my commandments. There's a great sports brand that has a great, great sign that applies to Christianity. Just do it. Just do it. Take what God has said. Take what the life that Jesus done, and it's really that simple. What do I need to do, preacher? Just do it. Just do it. Maybe there's someone here this morning who hasn't put on Christ in baptism, has not confessed, has not had that opportunity to repent and change. This is an opportunity where we can help you. Because we have all had to make that commitment as well. Some of us in our lives, some longer than others. Maybe there's someone who's done that, but if you really examine yourself, God is really not God in my life. But God needs to be. That's not an issue with anybody here. It's, it's an issue with God. And we need to make sure that's where it needs to be. And that's where prayer comes in. That's where confession comes in. And that's where the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from all unrighteousness takes place. And it goes back again to Him being the centerpiece of everything in our lives. If we can help you this morning, please come as together we all stand and sing.